Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Joining us today is Michael Gentili. Michael is a strategic resource investor and a fund manager for more than a decade. Thank you for joining us, Michael. My pleasure, guys. Good to be back. So, Michael, you know, you've, um, you've, you're, you're obviously well in tune with the markets. You're watching this stuff all the time. Do you think possibly the market is mispricing how many Fed rate increases are coming down the, t- down the pipeline? I mean, is, is there any possibility that perhaps the Fed pivots as we get deeper and deeper into this process? Absolutely. That's a, that's a top theme for me, Jim. And, and you know, you've, we've talked in the past how the Fed completely missed uh, in transitory inflation in 2020 and 2021. I think the expectations last time I looked, Jim, was nine rate hikes between here and February. So the next 11 to 12 months, the market's currently pricing in nine rate hikes. That would take the overnight Fed funds rate to two and a half percent. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's fantasy, uh, just as the transitory inflation commentary was fantasy uh, 18 months ago or 12 months ago. And the reason is, Jim, if you look what's going on with the consumer, the U.S. economy is 70 to 80 percent driven by the consumer. How's the middle class consumer in America feeling these days? Mm-hmm. Oil prices or gas prices are up 40 to 70 percent. Their food basket is up similar numbers. Uh, their interest on their floating rate debt or their mortgage has gone up 30 to 100 percent in the last several months. So the consumer is being pressured on all sides here. And the health of the consumer is dramatically overstated in my opinion, because those pressures are real and those are significant portions of the budget. You gotta eat, you gotta drive your car and you gotta find somewhere to live. And all three of those things are up dramatically in the last say 30 to 90 days alone. And so what that means, if the Fed's out there pushing rates, well, that's increasing your borrowing costs. Most consumers carry debt, it's increasing the cost of everything. So I think you're gonna see a real reaction from the consumer, anecdotally, I'm already hearing it. You know, wait times in restaurants are down, consumer cutting back on discretionary spending items, whether it be Winnebago's or boats or things that you think you don't really need uh, in, in a more strained kind of economic environment. So the economic numbers are always sort of backwards looking, but forward looking, I expect there's going to be a slowdown. And the Fed continues to push rates into these pressures on the consumer, you're going to engineer a recession. The other side of the coin, so the consumer's under pressure. Uh, but don't forget about Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam's going to be under pressure as well. We've, we've talked on the previous uh, interviews I had with you guys about the debt load in the US, the federal debt is $30 trillion and that excludes unfunded liabilities, which are multiples of that. But just assume the the published debt of $30 trillion as the interest on the 10 year yield has gone from 1% to 2.5%, that has a huge impact on your borrowing costs. So in 2019, the interest on the federal debt was $400 billion on a revenue line of 3 trillion. So about 13% of your interest expense was going to uh, cover that, that, that payment of the revenues of going to cover interest expense. If you take the two and a half percent yield currently is used that as a proxy for the global cost of debt in the U S for the federal government, that's now 750 billion up from 400 billion a short six months ago. So your interest um, cost is basically doubled just in the last three to nine months, let's say in terms of that, mm-hmm. if you assume that the fed is correct or the fed fund futures are correct and the, the overnight rate goes to two and a half. Well, your 10 year has to have a term premium, right? So your 10 year should be 4%, let's say if, it, if the overnight rates two and a half. That takes you to $1.2 trillion of interest alone. That would be 35 to 40% of your budget just paying the interest on your debt. That is completely unsustainable. That'd be up 300% from where it was in 2019. That would choke off the federal government's ability to spend any money anywhere else except on critical social security and, and maybe Medicare. Everything I'll else has to get cut. They'll just print it. They're, they won't be exactly. choked off. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's my point. So the yeah. rates cannot go there. So the Fed's going to have to helicopter money yield curve control, but the math is you cannot afford 1.2 trillion a year on your debt unless you have just massive inflation that devalues everything, which is which is probably where they're going to have to go. Wow. You know, I saw a statistic and um, $17 trillion has to roll over in the next two years, 17 trillion, meaning they haven't been, while rates were super low, they weren't they weren't fu- fu- they weren't financing the government debt by going out on on the on the long end of the of the curve. They were doing it all with you know two Short year curve. notes or shorter. So yep. they don't have a lot of runway room before the higher interest rates start hitting hitting the budget and, and start yep. swallowing the budget. Correct. I think the the number I put on a previous interview was the whole debt rolls over on average seven years. So the average maturity of the debt is seven years. So within seven yep. years, you'd be refinancing the entire thirty trillion dollars again. And that when you go to the market, two and a half, ten year. 3% 10 year, 4% 10 year, that's your borrowing cost. So they've been living in this fantasy land where you can borrow 10 year money at 1%. That fantasy is over unless they want to reintervene in the markets to suppress the yield curve, because that's, that's real cost. And, and they're, wow. again, the math, they were running a $1 trillion deficit in 2019 
when they had 400 billion of interest expense. Try on one trillion or 1.2 trillion dollars of interest structurally forever, not not just one year. That's permanent. That never gets paid down, right? So that is a permanent expense. And the government had no fiscal room before that without printing more money, like you said. So these are real numbers. It's it's uncont- uncontestable in terms of the, the size of the debt, the interest. You have to pay interest on your debt. So that's why I think those nine year rate hikes are are a fantasy, or they're going to have to print inflation at five ten percent structurally to to offset mm-hmm. that. So, Michael, what does this all mean? What's for the big picture of what our audience cares for? You know, gold, you know, silver mostly, but also gold. Our audience cares about that. What does this all mean for them? How should we be thinking in the medium term and the long term? Yeah, great question. So, if you if you agree with my premise that the the nine rate hikes are extremely unlikely in the next eleven to twelve months for the reasons we outlined uh, previously here, then if you assume that gold is gold is trading off those expectations, so gold is trying to price in right now nine rate hikes between now and the end of early next year. So if you believe that those rate hikes are not likely to happen, that is extremely bullish for gold. So gold here above $1,900 with nine rate hikes taking the overnight rate to 2.5% by February, which is extremely unlikely. If that expectation starts to come down, that's turbo fuel for gold, right? So that lowers the cost to ownership of gold and it makes real rates more negative, assuming inflation stays where it is, right? So Mm -hmm. that's my premise is that when the market realizes that these nine rate hikes are impossible without triggering a recession. Either A, the Fed says, oops, we made a mistake. It's not going to be an annual rate hikes. It's going to be two or three and we're done. Gold will hit new highs. If they, on the back of that, because the rate hikes expectations will come down, the gold price will trade higher. They're inversely correlated. Uh, second, if the Fed does stay on course and says, okay, we're going for nine, 10 rate hikes and they want to engineer a recession, well, that's wildly bullish for gold because what happens in a recession? Well, the Fed steps in, the government steps in to print more money and to <laughs> rescue the trillion, economy, which trillion. we've seen. So, <laughs> so I think in either scenario, either the Fed pulls back prematurely or we engineer a recession, that is the fuel to take gold to new all-time highs. So I, I expect gold to make new all-time highs in the next 12 months as these false rate expectations are wound down or they're followed through and creates a recession, which will make new highs for gold. Those investors flock to gold when recession rolls in. Do you think mm-hmm. it's they, we have to see some really negative economic information before those pressures change to what 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 will trigger the ped, the fed pivot away from fighting inflation to back to easy money the election pressure that you mentioned or we need right. some really like housing market falling apart stock market down another 20 or 30 percent before that changes the dynamics of the fed's priorities yeah so if you really if you're if you're a fly on the wall in the Fed meeting for the Fed meeting, the minutes they don't release to the public where they talk offline and actually talk about the real stuff, uh, uh-huh. if you really want to take inflation down, look about unemployment at record low levels. Everybody who wants a job has a job. There's 15 job offers if you want one to get a job. So the the supply chain is very tight. The labor market is very tight. Cost pressures are real and hard to to abate. The only way you really stop inflation is a recession. So if the Fed really wants to fulfill its mandate and say we are not going to care about the stock market. We're not going to care about Joe Biden's re-election chances in two years from now or the midterm elections coming up. We want to control inflation. If you're a fly in the wall, the only rational way to do that is to take out demand because the supply chain is there. The commodities are maxed out. The re- the retail part, the employment numbers are maxed out. There's no more wiggle room in the economy. So you need a recession to take out inflation. So that's bucket one. If they really want to assert their independence, what they should do is cut demand by causing a mini recession or a recession on the horizon to slow inflation down. Now, the second point you brought up, Jim, is, is that Joe Biden, Democrats, and the powers that be want that to happen in an election cycle, highly unlikely. So ask mm-hmm. your viewers their, their view of the true Fed independence, and that's which door they're going to walk through. But the reality is, if they want to take inflation down, to me, the only pathway is a recession. Will they choose that path? I doubt it, because the Fed has been very reluctant to engineer recessions in the past. Uh, and I think there'll be a lot of pressure coming from the Democrats to not let that happen. But either way, both those scenarios, to me, are quite constructive and bullish for gold. Just to choose which door you want to go through on the, on those two options. You know, and what and let's say we do hit a recession, which a lot of people are are, are whispering is coming. What does it take for the Fed to, to goose that baby back and get things moving again? Is it five trillion this time? Is it ten trillion? Are we are we expecting stimmy checks for the summer right before the midterms? I mean, I mean, I mean, they're I'm already, a, they're yeah. already talking about they're already talking about gas checks, gasoline checks in California, and. Uh, and, uh, you know, extra food checks in France. I mean, everyone's worried about the food inflation and, you know, food riots coming on in, in yeah. certain countries that don't, you know, are massive importers of wheat with the Ukraine situation. Are we expecting massive stimmy checks just to 
outweigh inflation. Yeah, without getting too political here, I'm Canadian, so I, I had to chuckle because I'm <laughs> from Quebec. And so, you know, if you look at what's happened, how was this a whole inflation problem created? Was the massive amount of money printing the last two years during COVID? So the government yeah. engineers a problem by printing way too much money, having money be way too easy for too long, creates massive inflation through money printing. And in my province of Quebec, what's the solution then? The government is currently sending a $500 check to 90% of the population to deal with the inflation that they created. So you <laughs> create the mess and you solve the mess by printing even more money, which nice. is only going to exacerbate the problem, right? So it's, to me, it's, 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 it's why I, have, I really need to own gold and own precious metals and own equities here because the governments are just continuing to make decisions that are going to constantly complicate the problem, right? And sound money and spending what you can afford both in a family situation and a government situation is the way to do it, but they just create problems and they solve with the same medicine that created the problem in the first place, printing more and more money. I don't know. I, I wonder if the politicians, do they realize what they're doing? It's just making it worse. And it's just a band-aid to, to be popular short term until the next election cycle. Just, to, you know, get through the next election cycle. That's all they care about. Right. And, and to a certain degree, it makes them more powerful because they're handing a check during COVID. They're handing a check during inflationary times. It makes people more and more dependent on the government, less dependent on their own abilities. And so I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, the government plays a larger and larger role in people's lives. So if you, if you want to get really nefarious, it sort of leads to like the government saying, well, this is good for them because they, people become more and more dependent on government checks. They become more and more dependent on the power of the government. The government becomes more and more powerful. Um, but it's not very good for Main Street Americans or Main Street Canadians who want to be able to afford a good quality of life and have a, a healthy economic future. So Michael, we're at the end of the first quarter. It's the end of March right now. How has gold really performed compared to the, the overall big market? Have you been upset are you disappointed or it, it's performed it's met your expectations what what are you thinking right now yeah I've been, I've been really pleased jim with i mean i think gold has proved itself yet again as the true store of value in times of market turbulence if you look at the price action in q1 from january to march i mean the market at the lows s p was down 14 15 percent at the lows nasdaq was down 20 percent plus if you look at how gold performed it was actually flat to up during that entire period. So in, in, a, in a true period of market turbulence, we haven't had many periods of real market turbulence, maybe 2018 uh, or 2008, 2009. In a, in a mm -hmm. true period of market turbulence, gold held in like a champ while every other asset class got demolished. And the riskier mm -hmm. the asset class, the more pain you took. You know, High-flying tech stocks down 40 to 70%. Uh, Bitcoin, the self-proclaimed gold 2.0 or the new store of value got Here's annihilated. the Bitcoin chart got annihilated. You see that there in February and March got completely destroyed. It's only rallied recently as the peace treaties broke out in Russia and the market's gone back to risk on. The S&P's rallied back off the lows. So Bitcoin yet again proved itself as a highly correlated asset class to the market and to tech stocks. And gold proved itself as a true store of value. When everything else was getting thrown out the window, mm -hmm. gold held in really well. So I think that bodes very well a longer term as institutional investors live through a very scary time in February, March. I can tell you a lot of funds are under a lot of pressure. And to see their perceived, you know, Bitcoin as a safe investment get destroyed, hopefully will lead to more investors buying the true store value, which is gold going forward. So I think it held up very well. It was a great test. And I think if things gotten worse, those, those trends would have continued in the positive direction for gold versus the market. Did you see Michael Saylor today just borrowed another $205 million to buy more Bitcoin for <laughs> in his companies? And, and, and he got a bank to let him pledge his other Bitcoin holdings as collateral on the loan to buy more Bitcoin. It's, wow. like, he, it's like he margined out his account. His account. <laughs> that's, that's always ended well in history when you borrow lots of money to buy highly speculative and highly volatile instruments. That usually works out really well in the long term. So Michael, you're, you're really known well in the community uh, as a great stock picker. And uh, you know the junior resource, all the commodity stocks really well. What are you looking for right now in this sector? Yeah, I've, I know it's a really interesting change of tone, Jim. Uh, as you know, most of the world's been locked down for COVID for the last two years. So I finally got to go to a major industry conference in late February. I got to see a lot of the mid to large cap gold producers, copper producers. And I would say it was a very striking change of tone for me. If you go back three years to 2019, the message from all those corporates was we're cutting costs, we're generating free cash flow, we're going to buy back our shares, and we are not doing any MA, we're not doing any, our growth strategy is return of capital and returns to shareholders. That was the mantra everyone was singing from. If you, if you go to the conference I went to three, four weeks ago, obviously still a big focus on returns and, and shareholder you know, returns, but I know it's a big shift from the mid to large tier names saying we're also looking at growth. And if you look at what happened in the last three years, four years in the gold space, you had the mega mergers, the Barrick, the Rands Golds, the New Gold, Newmont, New Gold Corp uh, transactions, uh, Agnico, Kirkland Lake. Then you had the merger of equals in the mid cap space where the $2 billion, $2, $2 billion companies want to be a four to $5 billion market cap a lot of those deals have happened. So now you're stuck with 
much larger gold companies with larger production profiles that have made zero investment in grassroots exploration the last 10 years and zero development assets in the pipeline. So that's why a lot of them now with gold at 1900, copper at 455 bucks, they're generating very good cash flow. They're looking at their asset lives and saying, we have a declining asset profile. We've got nothing in the, in the longer term pipeline to, to keep our production flat or increasing 10 years out from now. And so you're starting to see a lot of M&A in the development stage assets, which is where I really focus my time on exploration, early stage development assets. You saw GT Gold get taken out. You saw Ozzy Maria Resources get taken out. You've seen uh, Noron get taken out by uh, BHP a while ago, a big bidding war there. You're starting to see a lot of activity, you know, um, high profile on Great Bear getting taken out by Kinross. You weren't seeing that two, three years ago where the pre, you know, development, pre-production assets starting to get taken out at some very large premiums. So I think that's very, very positive for the junior exploration space because those stocks are still stuck in the mud trading at very low valuation, still seeing significant opportunities there. It only take a few takeouts in the kind of 50 to $100 million market cap space that 50 to 100% premium. So the whole group just start to light up as investors speculate on who's next. So I think the corporates are engaged, wanting to do more deals. The stocks are cheap. And I expect to see that wave for 2022 and next year as well. You'll see a lot more M&A in that space and that should lift the valuations of the entire group. And if you're lucky, you own some of the names that get taken out will be a big payday for a lot of investors that are being patiently acquiring these names. Well, I saw this one company that you recently were the, an investor in. It made a lot of news last week. Ivor Exploration. Let me uh, share this. Um, you were the corner. This is now. This is a uranium and silver play. They've got a silver element. That's why I was paying attention to it. Um, what you you've never done? You haven't done uranium in a long time, right? Yeah, it's good. It wasn't due to a, a dislike of uranium. I think I've said on your show and other shows before that the problem I have with uranium is a lot of these names end up trading at huge valuations. Uranium is scarce. There's a lack of quality project, which is why the commodity is valuable. Um, but a lot of these projects I look at are unbuildable mines, yet they still rock around mm -hmm. with 50, 100, 150 million dollar market caps because they're uranium and they're promoted. Uh, what I'm looking for, I've said in the past, is true projects that have potential to become mines, economically valuable mines that'll be producing the commodity. So it's hard to find the uranium space, a project that ticked all my boxes. And so what really got me to, in Ivor, got me really excited the second I heard the story was it's got fantastic grade. It's got 0.25% uh, uranium grade, which is about four to five times the average grade in the United States. It's in Nevada, which is a tier one location, which is a fantastic place mm -hmm. to build a mine. It's got 5 million pounds historic resource, but it's got lots of running room, both at depth and on strike. So I think this thing could be at least five times bigger in the current footprint, but they also have three kilometers of strike where they had up to 1% uranium, which is four times what their grade is currently uh, on strike, never been drilled. So there's, there's a real potential for, for grade, you know, scale jurisdiction. And then the final piece of the puzzle, they just nominated a strategic advisor from Next Gen Energy. Uh, they're building a, a really good, quality, high quality uranium team to go along with an A-plus asset. And then my last piece for me is the valuation is still extremely low. If you compare this to other, you know, deemed quality uranium stories in the market, it's still trading at a fraction of those valuations when I think the asset stacks up much, much better. So you yeah. got, it ticked all the boxes to me, uh, quite excited about the opportunity here. And I think and it's the right market. Uh, uranium is starting to heat up uh, mm -hmm. what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. So I see, I see a real opportunity for this asset to gain a lot of traction in the market. So the, the the person you were talking about is a guy named Garrett Ainsworth, right? And uh, yep. and Dave Forrest is the CEO of this company. And I don't know uranium, but from what people told me, these two guys are like two of the best guys you want running a uranium company. Two of the best, most respected names in that space. Well, here's another one that uh, you wanted to talk about that uh, you were, I, I don't know this company. So all I can ask is what stands out for you about Captain Mining? Yeah, so Capitan Mining, I, I thought it'd be topical for your viewers, Jim, because it's a high-grade silver story. Uh, as you know, quality uranium projects are rare, and high-grade silver stories are extremely rare, which is why uh, silver is, is quite attractive in the market, and the silver names typically trade a big valuation. So this name I bought about 18% of the company a year ago. It's got a gold oxide project in Mexico. It's got a pure Mexican-based team, very experienced, who built a lot of the gold oxide projects for Argonaut Gold, which is a mid-tier producer listed in TSX. So good team. A nice gold oxide project, about half a million to a million ounces of gold oxide. But the real sizzle for me when I got a year ago in the story was they had 3,000 meters of drilling in 2014 on this very high grade silver discovery, about seven meters at close to 1,000 grams silver. So a few wow. holes, never got followed up. Unfortunately for them, it was in 2014 when nobody cared about precious metals at all. So the, the kind of results fell on deaf ears. The previous owner ran out of money, handed it back to their joint venture partner, the optionee, so they had to be able to take the asset back. 
And this, this new team took over a couple of years ago. And so when I met them for the first time, I said, when are you going to drill that silver story? That's, that's really how this stock goes up 20 times. And they spent a year buying out the royalty. So there's a royalty in the project. They wanted to take that out before they drilled the silver project. That was successfully done. They've also been working hard on consolidating the land package to get more of it before they drill this. They drilled a hole about two, three months ago in their gold oxide project, a deeper hole that drilled through the gold oxide and accidentally, fortunately for them, hit the silver mineralization 350 meters deeper in a spot they wouldn't have expected it because it was 350 meters away from the known silver mineralization. So they did a 350 meter step out hole unbeknownst to them. And that kind of put the cat out of the bag. They had no choice but to talk about the silver project because that hole had to come out in the market. And so despite not consulting all the land, they're able to put that result out in the market. They followed up with some new holes recently. You can pull them up. Uh, they hit 50 some odd meters at 250 grams silver, including a few intervals of 1.5 meters above 1,000 grams, multiple hits of above 1,000 grams yeah. in the same hole. So this to me is an unknown story. It's got about $25 million market cap. People think it's a gold oxide story, but actually the high grade silver is quickly overtaking the whole picture and it has some significant legs to it. And it's not recognized or known very much in the market. I, I bought some shares in the open market two weeks ago, at 45 cents, how, how much I like it, despite owning 18% of the company. So it's definitely one for your viewers who like silver to, to keep an eye on, uh, high, high conviction and, and under the radar story. The big story with Russia and, and all these uh, sanctions that we're doing is Russia is one of the biggest producers of palladium and platinum, which is critical. And Clean Air Metals is another one that you recently bought. And tell us why. Yeah, so Clean Air, again, ticked a lot of the boxes for me. Uh, again, I'm looking for projects that are buildable, uh, economic mines that will get built in the next cycle. Um, this one really struck me. The chairman, Jim Gallagher, uh, sold his Lactazil project to Impala Metals for a billion dollars. This is 60 kilometers away, another platinum palladium project in the same mining camp. He sold that one and subsequently moved over to Clean Air Metals, uh, acquired about 5% of the company and became chairman. So I always you know, follow the money follow the smart guys. And in this case, it, it's in his backyard. He knows the project very, very well. Uh, the grade here, Jim, is probably two times the grade of the project he sold for a billion dollars to Impala. Uh, there's a 14,000 ton per day mill, again, 60 kilometers away from this project. So you got higher grade feed and this project would be about 3,500 tons per day. So taking about 20, 25% of your existing mill capacity, 60 kilometers away with twice the grade, uh, obviously has a huge uh, benefit to economics. So they put out a PEA uh, last year or late last year. Uh, that assumed they're going to build their own mill, right? And it still had a very nice NPV of you know 350 to 400 million dollars. If you take the mill out of the equation, you take your capex from 350 million to 200 to about 110 million. The mill's about 240 million dollars. So there's an easy play there where this 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 ore should be in the Impala mill. Uh, the former chairman used to run that mine, so he knows a bit about the the structure of that economics. The Russia thing was unfortunately you never want to profit from a disaster, which is war. But like you said, Ukraine, Russia. 30, 40% of the palladium production worldwide comes from there. Uh, regardless of how that conflict resolves itself, I don't think Russia is going to be welcomed back at the global table with open arms in terms of who will take your palladium and your resources uh, tomorrow, please. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the value of domestic source in Ontario and Quebec, platinum and palladium, uh, from an energy security perspective, from a battery metals perspective, a strategic perspective is very, very high. So that dramatically increases the value of these projects. And the stock's barely budged since the war broke out and, and, and was deeply undervalued when I got involved. So the company's well-funded, Buildable project, exciting exploration upside, and now you got this thematic of, of you know strategic sourcing of metals. I think the project's in a very good position to, to increase in value in the coming years. And the last one I wanted to talk about with you is a company called Stellmine that you got involved in uh, recently. Uh, what is it you like about Stellmine uh, that you're looking for? Yeah, so Stellmine is a really uh, early stage uh, grassroots opportunity in Quebec. I, I quite like Quebec. I'm from Quebec. I think it's one of the best mining jurisdictions in North America. Very friendly governments, very strong economic uh, support from governments uh, for projects. This one caught my eye because, you know, on the third page, you see it, the Coursey Discovery Hole was drilled by a, basically a Quebec-based exploration incubator, uh, government incubator, 42 meters at 4.2 grams in a very prospective region of James Bay, Quebec. So it's a very prospective region, sparsely explored. They put together a very good team led by Isabel, the CEO, and they've put together an even larger land package adjacent to Corsi with a really exciting target called Mercator. So you know, I wrote them a check to get involved. I'm a 9.9% shareholder. You've got a discovery hole already with fantastic grade. They're drilling some follow-up holes now. Those holes should be out shortly in and around Corsi. And then they've tacked on a significant belt of prospective land package at Mercator, which looks even better than Corsi. Uh, and so it's you know potential for discovery here is very high. It's early stage. You know, you need to know it's an early stage, 20 million-ish market cap in Canada, uh, but you're in the right belt, right rocks. 
and the right team uh, in the right province, if you find something perspective, it'll be extremely valuable because Quebec will be very supportive of this project. Well, Michael, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, the audience loves you. Uh, everyone loves to follow which stocks you're getting into. I know yeah. I do. Uh, I, I pretty <laughs> much do every stuff. If I see Michael Gentile getting in on something, I, I buy something of it. But uh, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank My you. pleasure. Happy to be on with you guys. Thanks.